All right, everybody. I uh, hope everyone is doing well. Um, it is April 7th or something like that. Losing track of the days now somewhat. Um, but anyway, let's continue on uh, talking about plants. And today we're going to talk about soil. All right. And uh, soil, um, basically dirt, if you think about it, um, is where the plant most plants at least uh, anchor into the soil and the roots of the plant are where they absorb water uh, and other nutrients that they need. Um, with the exception of a couple things like carbon dioxide, which typically come from the uh, leaves uh, of the plant. So the soil has some important properties. It helps anchor the plant for one, it helps provide water and it also helps provide dissolved minerals uh, that are in the soil. And there are different kinds of soil particles, and there are many ways to um, define them or distinguish them. Um, you can get a whole uh, degree in soil science. Um, so we're going to spend 10 minutes talking about soil and move on. I'm certainly not covering everything you could know about soils. Uh, because, as I said, you could get a whole degree in the science of it. Um, and so we'll just give some, some very basic parts to it. So first of all, one of the ways they break down soil or talk about it is based on particle size, how big the particles are. And we'll talk about three categories, sands, things that are sand, like, you know, when you think about going to the beach, sand, silt, oops, go back. Um, silt and clay and they're based on size differences so for example sand is usually in the neighborhood of 0.02 to 2 millimeters um, those are big i mean a sand grain you think is very very small but relative to the size of soil texture sand is the biggest of the particles uh, silt then tends to be 0.002 to 0.02 millimeters and then clay tends to be very, very tiny, less than 0.002 millimeters. Um, and the best kind of soil typically to grow most plants, but of course it depends on the plants, are what we call loams. And a loam is roughly kind of an equal mixture of all three of those parts. Typically it's a 40, 40, 20 mixture of sand, silt, and clay. Uh, we call that the most fertile soils we call loams. Now, um, when you're studying for this, uh, one thing I'll point out that I can almost hear you in regular lecture asking, uh, do you have to memorize the sizes? So no, you don't have to memorize the ind individual sizes. You just need to know the relative sizes of them. So sand is the biggest, silt's in the middle, and clay's the smallest. That'll do. Okay, next thing we'll talk about are plant control systems and how we control um, or how the plant controls using a variety of chemicals, things like growth and fruiting and making flowers and that sort of thing. And that involves then many kinds of plant hormones. Uh, so it helps coordinate growth, development, and certain kinds of environmental stimuli that we'll talk about in lecture and in lab. Um, and plant hormones are very much like the hormones that we have uh, and humans, uh, different names and, and different chemicals, of course, but they do the same sort of thing. So for example, in humans uh, and probably all animals, but, but definitely humans and most animals have a hormone called growth hormone. And that hormone is secreted by certain cells and it causes the other cells to divide and grow and things of that sort. So we, we have different hormones in animals, same idea, that a hormone is a chemical that's produced in one or several types of cells and it travels through the body or the plant to other cells and causes them to do something. So the first hormone we'll talk about is, is a very important hormone to plants and it does a lot of things. It's called auxin. And auxin does a huge variety of things for a plant. Um, and, and mainly it's controlled by the amount of auxin and auxin relative to other hormones we'll talk about. So auxin does things like it stimulates stem elongation, root growth, 
differentiation and branching, development uh, of fruit, uh, apical dominance. That's how the plant knows which part of the plant is on the top or away from gravity, if you will. And it also stimulates what we call, we'll, we'll see this in lab, phototrophism and gravitrophism, which is the idea that if you've ever seen a plant growing in the shade and, and it's the type of plant that usually grows really well in the sun, plants will grow uh, to or away from light depending on the plant and auxin's important for that. Or if the plant sort of knocked over, if you've ever seen a tree that's kind of blown over, but then it still grows. Um, plants can sense, um, in, in a way, the direction of the directional pull of gravity, and then the oxen can help the plant sort of redirect uh, its growth away from gravity or upwards, and I suppose towards gravity too, depending on the plant. Okay. So here's a neat experiment that shows kind of how we believe oxen works. And what they did is they took a plant that they cut the stem. And some plants, if you cut the stem, that's the end of them, but some of them will still grow. And what they did was they, they took a plant, they cut the stem, and they used an agar block. An agar block is the same sort of stuff in a petri plate, um, the jelly stuff that's um, a agar. It's actually a type of algae. And what they did, they took a block of that, put it on the plant, nothing happens. That's your control. So we, we want to make sure that it's not growing or doing something because of the agar. Then what they did is they take um, a same thing. They take the agar. Um, they take the agar, but they, now they infuse in the agar the auxin hormone. And when they put that on the plant, the plant grows upward. And then they've done experiments where what they do is they put that block of auxin on one side of the plant or not. And so you can see over here, um, let's call that the um, left side of the plant. Um, it's a little tricky. So if this was a human, you know, when, you're, when you're talking about a human or an animal, it's always the animal's right or left side. So let's, let's just say because of the picture, let's say that in this case, this is the this is the left side of the plant. So we're looking at the plant, but from the plant's perspective, if you were to stand behind the plant, that would be the plant's sort of left side. Doesn't really matter. It's a little bit confusing, I guess, depending right or left on a plant because they don't really have a right or left like animal. So l never mind. Let's just say it's the right side of the plant. How about that? Because in our picture, right? So we have this is our right, this is our left. So on the right side, they put the agar block and has the oxen in it. And that side then grows faster than the other side. And so the plant is going to curve like that based on the different rate of growth on one side versus the other. And then over here, it does the opposite of that, okay? The way we think this works is what's called the acid growth hypothesis. And what happens is in the presence of oxen, uh, oxen, the hormone stimulates this special uh, protein pump. The protein pump pumps hydrogen ions across into the cell wall. So remember, we have a cell wall and a cell membrane, which are different. Okay. And that cell wall, remember, is outside and is made out of cellulose and other things like that. And then the cell membrane's inside of that. And some organisms have a cell wall, but all organisms have a cell membrane, just as a sort of review since you know we're here doing what we're doing. So pump the hydrogen ions across, that activates enzymes that break up the structure uh, that holds that cell wall together. And the cell wall is normally strong and rigid and can't change. But when you break that cell wall up a little bit, the plant can take in water and things and grow in size. Um, and then you can rebuild that cell wall later. But that's how the acid growth hypothesis is thought to work in terms of how plants grow. Oxen does a bunch of other things too. It helps promote secondary growth um, by stimulating vascular cambium and secondary xylem uh, production. So remember when we're talking about vascular cambium, when we're talking about tree rings, 
Remember those grow basically every year and every year re represents a new growth of primarily secondary xylem, also secondary phloem, but it's very tiny and it's on the outside so you really don't see that much. So normally what we're counting is secondary xylem. Anyway, oxen helps that happen as well. It promotes advantageous roots at the base of a cut or stem. So it turns out there are some plants like geraniums where you can take a geranium plant. I used to do this at my grandma's house. Um, if you take a geranium, so here's my geranium plant. This is the leaf. Um, I can't draw because of, you know, I, I'm writing on the screen, which is a joke because of those of you who have me for class know I can't draw anyway. Um, I think that's one major I never considered was an art major. So I used to think about all kinds of uh, things I could major in. Many I, were, I was not good at, um, but art was probably never one of them, I think. But anyway, if you take a geranium and you cut it right there, uh, most plants, when you cut it, that'd be the end of the plant, right? But geraniums and a, and a few other plants, you can cut it and you can stick this plant with no, no roots anymore, just stick the stem right in the ground. And because of the oxen, uh, even, so, so there are things called root hormones you can get that have oxen in them and you can dip them in and it'll help that. But with geraniums and a few others, you don't even need that, you just stick it in the ground. And that stem will grow you new roots and you can propagate and copy a plant uh, just by cutting it and sticking it in the ground somewhere else. Um, oxen is the hormone that does that. It also helps or allows or promotes fruit growth without pollination. So there are a wide range of things that you buy in the grocery store, such as seedless tomatoes and other things. And there are a variety of ways we get seedless plants. Normally in nature, a plant has to be pollinated and the fruit develops and then you have seeds in it. But there are ways we have manipulated um, many plants, including this case using oxen. It's not the only way. There are genetic ways to do it as well. But one way to make seedless tomatoes is by using this hormone called oxen and you can get the tomatoes to develop the tomato without actually having to be pollinated, okay? Next hormone is cytokinins. Really, oxen is like, I'd have to say, probably the most important plant hormone. Uh, there's a wide range of hormones in animals that do a whole bunch of things, but there are some that are like critical and you find them like in every kind of stage of things. In plants, oxen, I'm gonna guess, is that main hormone. So, cytokinins, um, work in conjunction with oxen. And so if you have more cytokinins relative to oxen, then you get more shoot buds develop. And if you have more oxen relative to cytokinins, you get root development. So plants often are going through a cycle um, of whether they are, let's say, I can draw a kind of a pine tree because um, I've been doing that a long time. It's the, I can do it better too. Like, you know, this is kind of thing we did like in elementary school. And I probably am better at this because we had to do it so often. Uh, and it's still not very good. But so let's say this is my pine tree. And that's about the best. I mean, that's like, a, that's about as good as I can do, uh, sort of just going for it. Um, and then I would draw Christmas tree balls on it. But that's another story. Anyway, so here's my Christmas tree pine tree, conifera phyta, and plants are going through, and I never did this because you, you know, in school, as elementary school, you don't worry about the roots, but let's say there's my soil. Plants are going through a cycle where they're often growing more apical dominant kinds of shoot material. So all of this is shoot bud growth. And then root development is usually occurring below the soil. So depending on the season, plants are changing that sort of strategy. And that's based on the relative nature of how much cytokinin you have relative to oxen. So again, more cytokinin relative to oxen, you get more of this kind of growth on top. If you have more oxen relative to cytokinins, you're growing more roots, okay? 
and it will also stimulate germination of seeds um, and it will delay senescence. Senescence is plant death. Uh, so um, there are times of the year like when a plant goes through um, in, in the winter, maple trees and others that are deciduous will lose their leaves. And that's controlled in part by auxin and other hormones. Cytokinin sort of slows that down depending on the season. Next we have gibberellins and gibberellins promote seed and bud germination and stimulongation and leaf growth and it will stimulate flowers and fruiting again, all in conjunction with oxen. Um, in places like, in different industries, like in the grape industry, if you're growing grapes for eating grapes or you're making wine, um, the amount of grapes you can get on your plant is based on how long the stems are, because there's only so much room to grow the grapes. So gibberellins allow you to get longer stems and therefore more grapes. Or um, if you bought um, things like long stem roses, there are ways we can get a plant to grow longer stems than you normally otherwise would get. Gibberellins is your hormone for that. Next is ethylene. Oops, ethylene promotes fruit ripening and it controls what we call abscission. That's leaf loss. Um, abscission is leaf loss and um, and fruit ripening. There are all kinds of uh, devices that, that you can buy. I see them advertised every now and then where it's like a container that removes the ethylene from it um, and bags and things like that. I've had students say they own or bought them and it seems to work. Um, they're infomercials, so the science behind it, uh, this is more me telling you a story than claiming it works. I don't know if it works, but the idea is that that somehow controls the ethylene levels. Uh, certainly, let's say you had um, avocados and they're not ripe and you wanted to ripen your avocados. One, things pe one thing people do is they put their avocados in a paper bag. Uh, they wrap the paper bag up and they put it on top of their refrigerator or something like that. And what happens there is the ethylene um, in the avocados um, gets sort of trapped in there. Use the paper bag because it still circulates air through the bag, but it, it increases the amount of the ethylene trapped in there among the other avocados and it will help ripen them. And I think you put it on top of the refrigerator mainly for the, the, a little bit of warmth for it, um, which probably helps as well. Okay, next thing we'll talk about um, are these specialized proteins called phytochromes. And these also help regulate plant circadian rhythm and growth and things of that sort. And in this particular case, um, these phytochromes act as what we call photoreceptors. They are light sensitive. And they, like many proteins, uh, when you learn about protein search, you learn this is the protein. But sometimes a protein can be altered in different scenarios and take on different forms. It can be activated and deactivated based on uh, the presence of other molecules or in this case, light. So what happens with this photoreceptor is they are sensitive to um, red light, which comes in a wavelength of around 660 nanometers. And they're also sensitive to what's called far red light, which is in the neighborhood of 730 nanometers. So we have red and far red. They're both colors of red on the visible spectrum, but this particular phytochrome or photoreceptor is sensitive to that red kind of light. Red light and blue light are important in plants and they help um, with photosynthesis. So it's, it's not a surprise. Plants are green because they reflect green light. Plants aren't using the green light it's what bounces off and that's what you see. But plants are typically using for photosynthesis and things, the red color light and also blue. So in this case, they're sensitive red and far red light, 660, 730 nanometers. And so what happens is you have this protein and then if you were to expose that plant to red light, it would alter the form of that protein into a different active state. And if you were to hit that same protein with far red light, it would change that 
protein to the other state. So you're activating and deactivating this protein and that protein is typically turned on or turned off, if you will, by the color of light. Now, normally a plant is out growing in the wild and it's sensing with these phytochromes the amount of red light it gets in a day relative to far red light that it gets in a day um, as the sun changes position throughout the year. And because of that change, plants do different things based on the red and far red. Now, what we're gonna do here is um, talk about how plants do that and how we can kind of mess with them. My colleague and good friend, Mark Cooper, um, who I share an office with, um, who I hope doesn't see this because he, he's really smart. He's really, really sharp. He's a great teacher, but um, we, we, we have an attitude uh, competition, I think, that makes both of us better. And he's really very, very good. And one of his things he says, uh, and I steal things from him, ideas. So he'll call this messing with plants, for example. Um, and then there's a story about a crayfish and a guy named Bob Ohio. So if you ever take Mark Cooper for a class, you got to ask him about um, Bob Ohio and what happened with the story with Bob Ohio. Um, and um, I forgot what the other one was, messing with plants. Um, there's other ones. Anyway, Mark Cooper. So messing with plants. Oh, I know what it was, the crawfish story. Ask him why he stole my crawfish or crayfish story in the wildlife sanctuary if you take Mark Cooper for a class, okay? Now, you know, dozens of people in the world will know that story. Anyway, you take this plant and um, uh, we have two kinds of plants here. And this is confusing. So you're gonna want to, um, it's gonna take you a while. Uh, one of the advantages of teaching this course for a long time is there are little spots, and this is one of them, that you hit that you realize, oh, people have trouble with this every time. So I'm gonna explain it. And um, it's not that hard to do. It just, there's something about it that messes with your head. So I'm gonna explain it. I'm gonna answer the questions that people normally ask me about it. Um, give yourself a day to watch it and then watch it again and maybe again and, and at this part at least, and, and then ask if you have questions. So what we have in this case, we have two kinds of plants, okay? Um, there are plants that we call short day plants that tend to flower on a short day when you have short days. You have short days in California during the winter, okay? A plant like this, I usually ask you to think about it, um, and people, sometimes they get it. But anyway, toyon. Toyon's one of the plants on our list. It tends to flower in the winter. Toyon is an example of a short day plant. It flowers in the winter when the days are short. Most plants that we're gonna see are more like long day plants and they tend to flower when the days are longer. That's like what you get in the summer, okay? So that could be many plants. Uh, probably one of the best ones I'd say is California buckwheat. California buckwheat is one of those um, flowers in the, um, starts in the spring, but it goes all the way into summer, okay? So the days start getting longer as you go into spring. Most things, many things reproduce then. It's different in the Northern and Southern hemisphere, of course, um, in terms of the month. So the month isn't what's significant, it's the relative amount of light and that's why the seasons are different in different parts of the world. So it's the season that's important, not the month, which is sort of an artificial time stamp uh, on season, but it depends on where you're at. Now, if we take that normal scenario and we grow these two plants in a lab and we have a light system where the plant uh, gets either a short day or a long day, what we find, which would be no surprise, this is what would happen in nature, if you had a long day, like you make a day that's, let's say it's 14 hours, okay? In a long day, what you find is that a long day plant 
will end up flowering. And then this plant over here, it won't flower because it senses based on the light and the phytochromes that it's winter and so it doesn't flower, okay? Now, if you alter that and you do the same thing, you grow these plants in a lab, but instead you change the light cycle and it looks like they did just under 12. So I'm gonna say, you know, what does that look like? Maybe 11. You know, I probably would have done nine or something. But anyway, let's say it's 11 hours. So in 24 hours, it's less than the amount of the dark time is longer. And so the day is shorter. And what you get in a short day like that is that the short day plant flowers and then the long day plant doesn't. That's what happens in nature. You can do that same experiment in lab. Most people understand that. That's no big deal. This is where it gets tricky and where people have trouble. Okay. So it turns out if you take that same scenario, okay, where we have the short day, okay, and we take our short day and then we grow our two plants. We have a short day plant and a long day plant. But in the dark cycle, when it's nighttime, we turn on a light that has this red, not the far red, but the red color light in it. And that red color light, when you put it on the plant and people always ask, you know, is it a few seconds or I don't know, maybe it's, I'm guessing maybe it's 30 minutes or an hour. So I'm sure there's some kind of critical length. It might be different for each plant. Point is you give that plant during the dark cycle. Um, so during the dark cycle, you give that plant red light. Okay. Both of them, really, you're giving both plants in the dark cycle, the red light. That red light then flips the switch on those phytochromes and it gets the plant to do something different than it, what it would do in nature. So remember that normally in a short day, the short day plant's gonna flower and the long day plant isn't. But if we take both of these plants and in the dark cycle, we hit it with a red light, it's like we flipped a switch. And when you flip that switch, now, even though it's a short day, this plant doesn't flower and this one then does, okay? Now, what if we take the same scenario, short day, long night, and we hit it with red light, just like we did over here, but then we hit it with far red light after that. So we hit it with a red light, the red light causes the switch to turn from whatever it was before. And now we hit it with the far red light and that's like flipping the switch back to what it was. You turned a light on, then you turned it off. You flipped the switch on, you flipped it off. So what happens there is then my short day plant or my short day, even in a short day, what happens is that plant now flowers again. It's just like this one because I've turned the switch to something different, but then I've turned it back. This plant no longer flowers because same thing with the switch, okay? So I'm doing both plants in this experiment. So hopefully you're getting the point now. Now what I'm gonna do is in this scenario here, I have a short day, um, long night. I have a short day plant, I have a long day plant. And so what I do is I do red light, far red light, red light, light switch on, off, back on. So net result is I flip the switch. So now in a short day, this one doesn't flower, this one does. Over here I have red light, far red light, red, far red. Um, so short day, normally this would flower, okay? But I hit it with red light, flip the switch, Far red light, flip the switch. Red light, flip the switch. Far red light, flip the switch again. This one flowers, this one doesn't, okay? Um, you can do the same thing. Like what if the, see how over here in this experiment or in this first part, they had a long day. You could do the same thing. You could have a long day and do the red, far red, and it would do the opposite, okay? So if you have a long day and you hit it with a red light in the middle, it change, it's a switch, it changes. So this one would flower, this one wouldn't. If you did red, far red over here, 
the long day, you'd get the same results. Flip the switch, flip it back, okay? So think of the red, far red, it's like a switch. Can you do far red first? No, because in order to change the plant's um, phytochrome or to alter the form that it's in, it has to be the red light first and then the far red after that, okay? So if you just hit it with far red, um, the switch is already in that on position or off position or whatever it is, and the far red doesn't change it. It seems that you have to do the red first, then the far red, okay? Um, so there are really a great number of ways to ask this. You need to always think about um, a couple of things. Uh, what kind of plant do you have? Do you have a long day or short day plant? Okay, how long's the day? How long's the day? Is it um, a long day, which is like 12 plus hours, or is it a short day? Um, let's just say under, you know, 11. It's short, okay? You need to know, um, is the plant flower or not? Is it flowering or is it not flowering? And then finally, let's see, we got the kind of plant. We know how long the day is. We know short. We know how long the day is, whether it's long or short. We can know whether the plant flowered or not. And then the final bit of information is the amount or the number of times you did red, far red, okay? Um, I, just, I didn't write that well, far red. So there's essentially now, let's see, one, two, three. There's four components there, okay? Whether the plant, what kind of plant you have, long day or short day, uh, how long the day was, short day, long day, was it more than 12 hours or less than that? Did the plant flower or did it not flower? And how many times or what did you expose it to in terms of red or far red or none? Basically, you can figure out any one of the four if you know the other three. So that's what you want to think about. Um, I'm not going to give you all four because that just tells you what ended up happening. That's like teaching it to you. But I can ask you any of one of these as a question if I give you the other three. Okay, so that's what you wanna think about. All right, now um, I think I'm gonna save my ecology part for the next time.